You're good. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this public meeting. Call to order and do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, pursuant to executive order number 20-05 issued by the governor of the state of Rhode Island, this meeting will be conducted by electronic communication only. Members of the public wishing to access this meeting may do so at https colon backslash backslash y-o-u-t-u dot b-e backslash a-j-k-d four f-x-m f-m-s. The first uh, item on the agenda is public comment, which is uh, live tonight. Hey, Darlene, you're a go. Hello. Hi. All right. Good evening. So, am I on? Yes, yes. you are. Okay. Um, my comments uh, tonight are on the agenda item, the budget. Um, once again, the Warwick Public Schools is blaming the Warwick teachers for its budgetary issues. After 31 years in this district, I suppose I should be used to the annual denigration of teachers. But this year, after we teachers have worked so diligently and tirelessly to educate students through distance learning, in-person instruction, hybrid in-person instruction, full in-person instruction, and combinations of all three at once, the assertion that teachers are the cause of the district's structural deficit is particularly galling and completely outrageous. You need to acknowledge the amount of time and effort teachers have expended, often at the expense of their own families and loved ones to educate their students during a pandemic. As I've stated at school committee meetings for decades, the only elements that one needs for education to occur are students and the teachers to teach them. If there are no teachers, then there is no need for your bloated administrative bureaucracy and no need for a school committee. You are all superfluous. Before looking to eliminate teachers, perhaps you should be eliminating those who are far removed from the schools. And actually, before eliminating anyone, you should examine the true cause of your structural deficit, a cause that members of the administration and school committee have mentioned every year for over a decade, except for, curiously, this year. Over a decade ago, the city of Warwick underfunded the schools by a full 5% below the maintenance of effort amount permitted by the state legislature for that one year during the recession. Warwick was the only city or town to cut the full 5% and to not return any of it. And from that time forward, the Warwick Public Schools has been underfunded. Every year after that point, the school committee and members of the administration, such as the superintendent and finance director, would frequently mention this deficit and use it as a justification for its budget request to the city. I once heard the previous finance director report that the compounded loss of funding for that one year now extends into tens of millions, if not a hundred million dollars. Additionally, you should all remember the amount of money that the school spent paying the debt service on a very old bond year after year while the city, which was supposed to be paying the debt service paid nothing. Therefore, I wonder why not one member of the school committee or an administration has mentioned the amount of money the city owes the schools. A pandemic should not absolve the city of a decade of neglect. I suppose it's easier to just blame the teachers than to procure the, procure the funding to which the schools are entitled. As I previously stated, the only two mandatory elements of a school department are students and teachers. Your administration's premise that this year is that Warwick has lost so many students, there are now too many teachers. 
you need to examine that premise. Remember that the district had two consolidation events. In 2016, you consolidated secondary schools and reconfigured them. And in 2018, you closed and reconfigured elementary schools. At that time, the superintendent said the district was right-sized. In fact, over the past three years, the superintendent has repeated his assessment that the district is right-sized. He repeated it to the city last year at budget time. If there's a problem with student enrollment this year, don't you think that the pandemic and the uncertainties about education in the city might be to blame? You eliminated busing, voted to begin the year with virtual instruction, which by the way, I agree with you. I was on the radio defending you. I don't knock you uh, for, for starting the year virtually um, because you put everybody's health above uh, you know, your abuse from the state level. And then you opened a few properly ventilated buildings for full in-person le learning for special pro populations, which was the right thing to do. Once you learned that, you know, Warwick Vets and the Career Center and Drum Rock of uh, the building had the proper uh, ventilation, you put students in them. I mean, you, you did what you should do, should have done. Um, however, obviously it, it caused uh, commotion through no fault of your own. And then you opened elementary schools to hybrid instruction, which as you know, also included virtual instruction and was the most mentally and physically exhausting modality for teachers, by the way. Then everyone went virtual when Corona cases spiked in December. Then everyone went back to school with elementary full in person, secondary and hybrid. And now everyone's gonna be full in person with virtual option still open for students and hybrid option open for secondary students. Meanwhile, there's been commotion in every step of the way this year. And most recently there was commotion over what Mondays would bring. All right, so all of this commotion obviously led students to go other places. And some of those places um, we know that the homeschooling numbers increased. And we also know that the parochial school numbers increased. Uh, the Providence Journal did a, an article, and in that article, they stated that there are about 5,000 students that are unaccounted for this year. However, um, in the fall, when you will be providing the proper busing, when school will be open for five full days a week, when virtual will no longer be an option unless we use it in place, uh, if it snows, we use it for snowy day instruction so we don't lose um, a day out of the year, then we know the students will come back. I mean, if not all of them, at least a good number of them. And when they come back, um, we'll, we'll be right-sized as we are right now, but you won't have the teachers to teach them because you will have eliminated them as relief for your structural deficit, in quotes, of course for which we were never the cause in the first place. All right, now I have some specific questions um, pertaining to specific pages in your fiscal year 2022 superintendent recommended budget. On page five, there are outrageous student enrollment reports and projections and a conclusion based on the inflammatory opinion that this enrollment decline is our inability to compete with increasingly higher performing alternatives available from other LEAs. Prove that statement. Right now it's conjecture. Have you conducted exit interviews? Did you specifically ask every student who was in Warwick last year but is not in Warwick this year if that's the reason? I think not. The truth is that this year was chaotic. And over the past few years, um, we've lost students to this Pathways program, which has siphoned our students out. We know that there were two districts in this, in this state that got in on the ground floor. Ride approved their programs um, in the blink of an eye and has since moved the goalposts for all of the other districts in the state. Warwick has tried and, and succeeded in getting pathways approved, but we've also failed in a few. And we have failed because those goalposts moved, not because of the courses that we offer. And that um, has 
you know, prompted this decline in enrollment. Once we get our pathways up and running, maybe the legislature will step in and put a moratorium on this whole mess until Warwick and other districts like it can catch up. Because what they've done now is allow what are now inferior programs in these other districts to have been grandfathered in. And Warwick and a lot of other districts like Warwick are at a disadvantage. Another opinion on page five is that there will be state intervention. The individuals presenting that Barton Gilman report also used this unfounded scare tactic. By the way, that report is already over a year old and based on data that's at least two years old. And yet you people can tend to lend it credence. There was really no reason, although I do know the reason, for it to be the subject of uh, one of your recent school committee meetings when you had an entire meeting with the city last year in uh, December 2019 to go over it. Um, page six of the recommended budget contains quite a whopper. So Warwick's per pupil expenditure ranks among the highest in the nation. I would love to see your calculations. Have you checked every school district in the entire nation? Have you even checked the other 35 districts in Rhode Island? In your hyperbolic glee, why stop at the nation? Why not just say that Warwick has the highest per pupil expenditure in the world? As far as your basis for preposterous claims, all the reports that you cite as uh, evidence for your claims are based on opinions, biased, and contain selective comparisons. And now they're outdated. Your November uh, 20, 20, 2019 five-year projection shouldn't even count as a source because it's your own document. Of course, you're gonna make it say what you want it to say. Most egregious are the Barton Gilman reports. Fairly recently, you allowed two authors of the reports to repeat their specious arguments and spurious conclusions that they first uttered in December 2019. Yet, they did not address the new material in the phase two report. The phase one report was filled with inconsistencies, omissions, selective comparisons, biases, opinions, and outright fabrications. You allowed these people to compare Warwick to East Greenwich and Coventry as opposed to other urban ring districts. You allowed these people to throw around words such as illegal and unconstitutional and to threaten you with a state takeover. And yet they offered not one scintilla of evidence. Clearly the whole goal of allowing these two individuals to rehash their previous attack was to lay all budgetary issues on the unions, both the WTU and WISE, since throughout their report, the Barton, Gilman, Hitman engage in the same hyperbole that occurs in the superintendent's fiscal year 2022 budget recommendation. On page eight, there is a recommendation to add before and after school programs. If you're cutting staff to save money, how are you going to add more staff? Are you sure that these programs will be self-funding? How much would you charge parents to make them self-funding? Do you know how much money the district will have to contribute to pay for these programs? Also, shouldn't ESSER money be used for our students during the school day? How much are you going to have to spend to keep facilities open on the weekends? Are you going to char charge community groups and local children for using the facilities? On page nine, I wanna point out that local funding increased due to the following reasons, which you neglect to mention. In 2019, the school department cut sports and a bunch of other budget items that totaled close to $4 million. Sports was about number 17 on your priority list of uh, budget cuts. You had like 31, 32, 33 something. I don't remember the exact number. And sports was about number 17 or 18. So wanting to give the schools money for sports, because of course, cutting sports makes people take notice um, about budget crises. Um, the, the city went ahead and provided you with uh, the funding for sports and for all of the other um, items above sports on your list, which was a, which was a great ploy um, to put sports you know, further down the list. Last year, the city provided $2 million more, but the school department was asking for somewhere between 8 million and 11 million. I can't remember the exact amount and I didn't look it up. As I stated earlier, the city still owes the school department based on the 5% below maintenance of effort cut, the effects of which have continued to compound as the previous finance director presented on more than one occasion. The school department has a structural deficit because of this maintenance of effort cut. 
and the city knows it because you've told them it. You or your or previous iterations of the school committee and the previous administration. On page nine, there should be a breakdown of the grants that are going to allegedly fund 5.5 million in operational expen expenses. On page 11 are statements about healthcare. Last year, you're, you predicted that healthcare would increase set by 7%, but really it increased by 4%. This just shows that no one can predict the future and that the outrageous pronouncements in this document should be taken with a shaker's world of, worth of salt. On page 14, what is multi-tiered middle school busing? I think you should ask that. What is the breakdown of the 12.2 million in out of district tuitions? To see where exactly those out of district tuitions are because if they're a special ed, there's probably not you know, much you can do about them. If it's pathways, then maybe we can try to make up for that and get our own pathways approved. On page 16 is the statement that this budget is based on identifying, securing, and using alternative funding for these significant categories. Example, bond funds, ESSER three, private donations. Do you currently have these bond funds, ESSER three funds, and private donations in hand? Have you categorized these funds? Have you earmarked them for certain uses? I'm fascinated to know where you're getting your private donations. Maybe if you do another sun butter, you'll get Chobani involved again. On page 18, I reject the notion that we've lost 1,200 students since 2016. If so, why are some of the schools still so crowded and why haven't you closed more? Furthermore, with the consolidations in 2016 and 18, as I already mentioned, the superintendent said we're right-sized. Last week, a member of the school committee asked the superintendent about being right-sized. He said that we are. He said that there's no need to close another school at this time. He predicted that maybe an elementary school might have to close in seven years. I do know that over time we have lost 264 teachers. So I don't know why this budget is filled with ludicrous claims about overstaffing. Page 18 also contains more hyper, hyperbole about the per pupil expense, but at least Warwick's is allegedly only the highest in Rhode Island and not in the nation or the world. The calculation of this expense and comparisons to other districts are unreliable due to the expenses that Warwick has, such as social security, but others do not. And everything, uh, nothing lines up precisely. I think some of you learned that when you were conducting your own um, forays into other districts and their expenses and even um, positions don't line up exactly in administration or otherwise. Furthermore, as to the ratio of professional staff to students, I would love to see your calculation methods. Classrooms are full, so the professional staff is clearly needed. Remember that the professional staff includes classroom teachers, special education teachers who provide both classroom and resource instruction, guidance counselors, reading specialists, math interventionists, elementary itinerant teachers, librarians, nurses, occupational and physical therapists, social workers, school psychologists, EL teachers, tech integrationists, GBP coordinators, and so on in case I forgot somebody. We now have a nurse in every school. We have more social workers and psychologists and we could use even more. You can't use the ratio numbers in the Barton Gilman report unless you know their methodology and the circumstances in every other district, which you do not know because the Barton Gilman report is selective and incomplete. In all phases of the report, the perpetrators of the report frequently compare apples and oranges. The ratio number is a prime example. On page 19, you are proposing the reduction of professional staff by 34 FTEs. I'm sure that you may be able to achieve some of this reduction through attrition and not through layoffs. Have you explored this avenue? Have you thought about what will happen in the fall when some students who were homeschooled or went to parochial schools this year come back to the district and you need teachers in the classroom to teach them? Also on page 19, why would you even mention the possibility of abolishing athletics, art, and music? because you wanna be inflammatory, that's why. You have money problems because you earned a funded 5% over 10 years ago and that deficit has been compounded and has exponentially increased over all those years. You can't let the city off the hook. Page 20 repeats the outrageous claim about the per pupil expense. A reminder, teachers are the largest employee group for a reason. We work directly with the students. We are the only necessary group. Without us, there's no need for anybody else. 
the administration is superfluous. The teachers deliver the services to the students. However, the entire district is a service provider. So of course, most of the budget goes to the salaries of every employee in the district. None of us are volunteers, although you probably wish we were. The numbers on pages five and nine need more explanation and page 27 is kind of nonsensical. How can you separate local funds from all the rest? Um, the superintendent's recommended budget is flawed because it does not acknowledge the structural deficit that the city caused through its 5% below maintenance of effort uh, funding over a decade ago and the money that the school department incurred when it was paying the debt service on the bond. Furthermore, the budget contains flights of fancy, hyperbole, and mathematic acrobatics for which we used to have a name, but that person is no longer in the district, so I won't say it. We teachers are the largest employee group for a reason. We are the ones providing the education and support services that students need. This past year has been hard on everyone and it's high time to acknowledge the hard work that teachers have done in chaotic and impossible circumstances. We're not a structural deficit, we are the structure. Thank you. Thank you, darling. Madam Chair, there are no other public comments this evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neko. Thanks. Our, our next item is on un, unfinished business discussion action of the FY 2022 superintendent recommended budget. Mr. Baxter. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, again, Pardon me. Yeah, we, we presented the budget uh, over the last couple of meetings, and I uh, respectfully ask you to consider the budget and adopt it at the recommended budget for presentation to the uh, to city council. I'll, Madam, I'll entertain any questions. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, yes, Mr. Testa. Probably have a comment and a question. To go. My comments will lead to a question. Um, I, I would I would address. Um, the, the previously mentioned cut from the city back in 2009, I think it approximated about $5 million to $6 million. So multiple ad times 10 years, it's $50 million. Um, and I would be one always standing up talking about the lack of um, effort on the city's part. Having said that, the fact that the city cut us 5% in 2009 doesn't change the fact that you, you, we've lost a significant amount of students. So. What, what's particularly interesting to me is without any cuts, this budget would approach $200 million. And if anybody, anybody thinks the city wall should be spending almost a quarter of a billion dollars on its public education, the rocks in the head. Okay, we have lost kids. There's no question about that. Some of it has been COVID related. Some of it has been demographic. Some of it has been pathways. If there's a whole, it's an all of the above um, thing. It wouldn't be the first time that at the end of a, at the beginning of a school year, you have more kids coming back. We've seen this before. We've, we've seen this movie before. It's happened before. And every district has had that situation and we would have a way to deal with it. The, 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 the fact of the matter is to Mr. Baxter's point in this presentation is this is about population. It's about what you have here today and, and, and what you need to teach those kids today. Nobody likes cutting positions. Nobody does, okay? Nobody enjoys it, okay? But the fact of the matter is education has to be paid for in the city. So in light of a pandemic year, I do not see any justification for going to the city to say, give us an extra X. When I think it's been, it's been, it's been, shown that we don't need to do that, okay? We're not looking to shortchange kids. We're not looking to reduce programs. And I take very big issue with the, the fact that this committee currently, as currently comprised or previously comprised, applied, use sports as a ploy, okay? I take grave offense at that allegation, okay? It's a, it's a ridiculous allegation. It has no basis at all. Having said that, um, 
I don't see a way out of getting into balance. I don't see, I, I will not support going to the city and asking them for more money. We can go and have a parlor conversation about what they did in 2009, because what they did in 2009, the actions to deal with that were addressed in the ensuing years when we closed schools, we went through the painful high school reduction, we went through elementary consolidations. We've done all that. And then finally, and I think I said this at one of the public meetings, you cut, you cut, you cut. At some point, you're cutting into bone here. Okay, so you can't, you can't keep cutting your way out of it. But, but this, the district cut its way into, a, I'm going to call it a point of equilibrium, which is a bad term to use, bad word to use. But all of that underfunding, we dealt with that. Okay, we're at a point now where this is strictly population driven. I don't, I don't see how you can argue that it isn't. And if we had 130, 35 students homeschool and they all came back, they would come back across a myriad of grades and we would deal with that eventuality. Okay, I have friends of mine who, who have been teachers in Warwick and, and I remember at the end of the year, the layoff notices would come and then they get called back. It, it, it's, a, it's a common occurrence in every district. What's different about Warwick is we're bleeding kids. Okay? And that's what we need to be focusing on. Why are we bleeding kids? Okay, so the pathways is a point, but as I mentioned in a previous meeting, even if the, the General Assembly passed out pathways legislation, you wouldn't see anything from that for three to five years. Any, any, any positive benefit with kids coming back into the district. And the General Assembly is never going to eliminate it. They're never going to eliminate it. Whether we like it or not, that some type of that choice is here to stay. So we have to deal with that, but I don't want to get off topic. But the point of the matter is, I think yeah. Mr. Baxter submitted his budget. We have X number of students. We can deal with the eventuality or potentiality of some of those kids, either a small number or a significant number coming back. But I don't know how we can good conscience go to the city to say, we need more money when I think we've already shown, it's already been shown that we can balance our budget without asking them for anything. But that's my opinion as, as one of five members of this committee. Um, and I think that's it, Mr. Baxter. I do have one question on your documents. Um, your, one of your documents, you had a total FTE reduction of 35, and then on the second page, it was 34. So if you can just explain that, that one difference, please. Yes, yes, Mr. Testa. On um, the... Uh, uh, on page 19 of the budget document, it, it uh, specifies a professional staff reduction of 34 FTEs. And, we're, and, and in general, we're looking at a total staff reduction of 35 FTEs, one FTE being a, um, uh, a wise position that will be lost through attrition. Okay, so that explains it. Okay, um, that, that really is the only question that I had. I'm sorry, I got long-winded and I got a little emotional but um and i'll speak for myself because I, I don't use kids as pawns never has never have and never will because i had my own and uh, and i know what went through what what this committee went through last year with with the sports and, and the cuts and everything else and we all remember very well the kids lining up mm -hmm. and, and and saying things about you know speaking in mind as, as as they have the complete right to do okay but for anyone anyone to make an allegation that we would use sports as a ploy or anything as a ploy, okay? Just crap. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions from the rest of the committee? Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Bacchus, we can't see you. No, I, I can't see me either. But <laughs> okay, no. so you're on You're on through the phone, okay. Just I'm so I know that. I'm actually on, I can, I'm watching, I'm watching, but it won't let me Right. Okay. Just oh, so we friend. know that, so people Mr. know. Taylor. Okay. Mr. Taylor would try to fix it. But we haven't okay. Had so uh, I well remember uh, when the five percent uh, cut hit us, and it was uh, it, it was pretty devastating. And while David and I may see it a little bit differently, uh, we did need to close schools and. We did need to uh, take some initiative to, to uh, make things more manageable and things like that. Uh, however, uh, I believe that the committee did not take 
the, the steps that were in the best interest of the city or the school department at the time. We, we are, uh, in so far as the highest per pupil um, concentration that goes to uh, the state of New York at somewhere around $36,000 um, average. Uh, we know they're in a very different situation. And there are other places that are higher than us, but $22,000 is high for, for Rhode Island and, and for a Rhode Island school. Uh, and I, I'd like to see I'd like to see us either regain pupil population and bring that down, uh, which would be ideal, or um, we're going to have to at some point make cuts. And because last year was COVID, we don't know what's going to happen in so far as next year. But uh, we do have to look at uh, contractual issues and things like that. Um, everywhere uh, so th th you know this is another tough budget we we never used sports sports was sports was an issue it came up it was addressed uh, we actually got about eight million dollars out of the city in those couple of years but we had been starved for a long time before that because the previous administration prior to um, Mayor Solomon uh, did not, I don't think, seize the schools as vital to the city um, and to making the city the best it can be if we have great schools. So uh, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thornton. Madam Chair, thank you. Just one quick comment. Yes, it is true. Um, I have on a few occasions said we are right-sized. And once again, by that, I mean 13 elementaries, two middles, two highs. But within that, we react to population. For example, at an elementary school, you may go from three grade twos to two grade twos. The same building's open. You're just adjusting your, your sections or classrooms by population. So that's what I mean by right-sized. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Norton. Mr. Cornell? Yeah, so um, I understand many people are, are concerned by reading budget and seeing the um, 35 FTEs being proposed for layoffs. And uh, of course, that's alarmed to all of us. Like, it, it just makes me sick thinking of it. However, we aren't, um, we have lost a lot of students, but I, I would be open for requesting the city for an increase of um, nothing um, too much, but like something. So maybe it could help us with personnel and even student programs. And regarding student programs, like, like um, music and arts and sports, like there's no way we can, we should touch that this year. Like students have been through enough with COVID um, and they've lost so many, so many opportunities and events. It's just, they need this more than ever. So we should not touch that all. And maybe we can ask to see for more money, something reasonable, maybe um, a million or, or so. And that could help us out because we're, the fact is we're not fiscally comfortable. Like, although we have a balanced budget, it, it's not like it, we, it's not good enough. So we, um, so I would be open for, to an increase. And I think, and it makes sense. And I think we owe it to our personnel, the school department, the students to for this extra money, because we're not like many other school districts and municipalities. We're not in a comfortable situation. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Um, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, so, I mean, I would, I would just mimic, uh, echo everyone else. Um, uh, Mr. Testa, uh, I, I mean, I also take offense to the whole cutting sports and after school activities as a ploy. I mean, we were all there. We all know that we, we had to make cuts and that's, that's what again was, was put on the table and then, the community made uh, made it, it very clear about why that was the wrong decision, and then the city was able to uh, give us the funding to bring it back. Uh, I understand what Mr. Cornell is saying about potentially going to the city and asking for for more money. I do also see that it is a hard 
fiscal uh, fiscal time for everyone considering the pandemic. Um, and yeah, the structural structural deficit started 12 years ago, but there's not exactly anything that we can do for it now. Yes. Like, yes, the city council was the one who started it, but we can't exactly force them to give us, what is it? Mr. Tessa said $15 million like to, to, yeah, to make up for it. So it's, it's just a, it's a terribly hard uh, experience, uh, experience, but situation. So I think we're just, I think overall, just budgetary. Yes, the structural deficit is large, but I think probably a, a, we just need to figure out a way down how to how to rebuild it. That's that's really it, and that's all for me. Ms. Marcus, I just wanted to um, comment on Mr. Cornell's idea about going to the city. Most years, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But there are a lot of taxpayers that are hanging on by a thread where government assistance and other uh, charities are helping them get through the days and weeks and months because due to unemployment and all the issues with COVID, I mean, I don't see how the mayor can even, maybe well, maybe he will do a tax increase, but I can't imagine a tax increase and if there's no tax increase then there is no additional money it's already allocated so thank you okay i'm i'm gonna speak now now that my colleagues have all spoken um first of all i want to say that i'm deeply mad that it was said that we cut sports to try to get something. When we cut sports, I remember it like it was yesterday, I had tears in my eyes. If anybody knows me or, know, or, or knows who I am, sports was a huge part of my life in high school and growing up. And that was probably one of the toughest things I've had to do, if not the toughest thing I've had to do so far on the school committee. And I'm very, very hurt that anybody would say that we did that as a ploy to get something. It was either that or we cut programs for education. We knew everybody who was present knew what was on the table. And we're here to educate children first and foremost. And we could not cut services and programs that help our children with their educational needs. And that was what we, it came down to. It was either cut educational needs and keep sports and cut programs that help children to get through school or, or keep the sports. And we had to make the right decision at that time. And it was horrible. It made me sick to my stomach and I was crying and they were real tears. And that I'm just completely flawed that that was said. Um, secondly, I do understand the hardship that everyone has had meaning the city, the school department, I mean, and, and it's across the board through di every district, I'm sure, um, in every city and every state that we all have had hardships because of this pandemic. However, we talk about the loss of our kids and, the, and, and, and our population decline and pathways, and we can just go on and on and on, I don't see why we wouldn't ask for a small amount of money from the city, like a million dollars, even 500,000, because we can use that to maybe develop something that's going to bring these kids back. We can't make and design new things to keep kids in our district from, you know, going other places if we don't have any money to do that with. So, you know, I am worried and I already, I, I, I will express my concerns. I mean, Last, last year, my colleagues were enticed on, on cutting transportation. I did not vote for it. It turned into a debacle. It probably forced us to, to lose a lot of kids. However, if we cut these teachers and then all these kids come back, that's my concern. I don't wanna hear, we don't have a balanced budget now and we didn't ask the city for anything. Um, 
I, I am extremely nervous about that. Um, my, my questions were answered very thoroughly by Mr. McCaffrey and Mr. Baxter, and I do appreciate it. It made me a little bit more comfortable that there is wiggle space to bring students back without, you know, having complete chaos. We don't need any more chaos. It's been a tough year for everybody across the board. So um, I will say that as the chair of the school committee, I was very upset that myself was never notified nor were I allowed to appoint anybody to go or even myself to attend any meetings with the city about about budgetary issues because we're the ones making the decisions, not you guys. And I, as, as the chair, we have five people and somebody should have been attending those meetings. And I should have been able to either go or I should have been able to appoint someone to attend that. And I'm very un unhappy because we're sitting here talking about asking for money, not asking for money, but we weren't really there to hear the, the, you know, the meat and bones to what their issues are and discuss this, other people did that for us. And so we're sitting here making decisions on stuff that we didn't get a good explanation for. And that that definitely concerns me and upsets me that that happened. Um, there's supposed to be transparency between the city and the school department. We're the ones that make the decisions and no one's there. I, 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 there's no transparency to this committee from the city then. So I, I'm, I wanna, explain my my very big dissatisfaction on that on that level and it shouldn't continue like that anymore um i've gotten a lot of messages sent to me emails calls saying that you know we're blaming the teachers for this budget i don't think anybody in this room and anybody present is blaming the teachers I certainly am not. I know Mr. Cornell is, and I'm sure my other colleagues are. I, I don't, Mr. Test is nodding his head back and forth. No, the problem is there's a, a, there is a population decline. And as, as it was just explained from, from Dr. Thornton, if we have three classes and we can't fill them, one has to be closed. This is not something that we're blaming anyone. I think um, anybody who knows this committee, isn't here to happily fire teachers. We don't want to do that with anything. We want the best for our district and we have to do what's best for our district. And I'm not happy about all of this. And I wish I could go to Mr. Baxter and say, we can't do this and tell us where we can get cuts because the cuts are gonna come again from sports and other things that are gonna hurt kids and we cannot hurt children anymore. We, they deserve to have an, a good education from us and we should be able to one, afford it <laughs> and two, give it to them. So um, I just keep my fingers crossed that we don't have a debacle of a big poor back of students. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm deeply hurt that we have to, that, we, that it has come to this, but I have to understand it. It was explained thoroughly to me. That's what I have to say but I do think we should ask for a little bit of money from the city. It, you know, it's something we usually ask for a lot of money, but we should ask for something because we don't have money to play with in a positive way to maybe get a new CTC program in that somebody doesn't have. We need to focus on this stuff. We need to, to I know Mr. Baxter is on, on this page with me because um, we've talked about it. We need to do things that are gonna attract people to our district. It's a game now and we have to get involved. And with no money, we can't get involved. We just watch our kids walk to places like North Kingston and Ponagansett. So I think that would be the right thing to do. And maybe we can get a little bit of something and we can put it towards programs because that's what I would like to see the money used for. Thank you. Mr. Baxter, anything else? No, I'm, I'm happy to, if in the motion, you, uh, to adopt the budget, I, I guess I would say two things, uh, to um, increase the revenue, the local appropriation from the, the city. We're happy to, happy to do that. And, uh, you know, we can at least ask. I, I would still uh, recommend to the, to the school committee that we 
maintain the, the same level of um, position reductions. And I want to call it position reductions due to enrollment because they're not all uh, layoffs. They're, that, that, there's some number that will be net after just regular attrition, retirements, and that sort of thing. So it's, uh, I just want to reiterate that as well. And then, um, uh, but because of the timing and you know everybody's aware of the, the deadlines that come up, we, we do need to send out those, those notices and that we would have to, uh, um, you know, in order to balance the budget as presented, we would need to have the notices sent out in the event that the, um, uh, you know, the city doesn't increase the appropriation. And then also to your point, Madam Chair, that, um, you know, we would use the, uh, whatever increase we got for uh, some sort of programmatic development or, or whatever. So we wouldn't be using it for that. So, so I, I would just, uh, I guess to summarize, I would just um, recommend that we can change the revenue line, but, but uh, it, if you adopted the budget as presented that we, uh, you authorize us to go ahead with the um, uh, position reductions due to our enrollment decline. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Adams. Uh, if we were to do that, is the budget unbalanced? May, may I, mm -hmm. so 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 no so if we if we increased the um, uh, the revenue by a half a million dollars, it would we would increase the expenses. I, I based on the programmatic, I would uh, base park it in an object code uh, that would have something to do with uh, programmatic improvement somewhere. We'd have to. Work okay. out specifics, but but it would be in balance. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baxter. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Testa. Okay, Mr. Hennius, we're going to get you involved here. Um, I will make a motion. I want to make a motion that we adopt the budget as submitted by Mr. Baxter. That does not have your addition in it. So, if my motion is seconded, then they could amend it. Correct. That that's correct. Someone can make a motion to amend. Okay. I, I, I think we shall go on record as to what we want to do here. So I, I make a motion that we, we adopt the budget as submitted originally by Mr. Baxter. Second. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Coyle. I move to amend to increase the budget by a million dollars with um, 500,000 designated for personnel and 500,000 designated for student, prog uh, student programs. Dr. Thornton. So just thinking this out loud, um, if it's half a million for personnel, are we suggesting we're keeping staff that I don't have students to put in front of them? Well, it will be a contingency plan because we might have a situation because I don't know who the 35 FT people will be. We might have a situation that we actually need somebody and we won't be able to balance the budget. So then we that will help us. And then we won't have to lay off all, maybe we'll have to lay off all 35 staff members. So that could be helpful there. And then we'll have money for student programs, which would be great for the community. Yes, Mr. Tesla. Chair, thank you. Um, Mr. Cornell, I'm, I'm not very comfortable. I mean, I am not comfortable asking for more from the city anyway, but if I was, I wouldn't be comfortable telling Mr. Baxter and the administration where to earmark it. If it's an extra million dollars, he said he'd park it in an object code. So if it's even uh, appropriated to us, then we will have time to see who what the population figures are. And if you have to add back more teachers, that's where it's gonna come from, right? So I think to just say, go ahead and earmark $500,000 for personnel, um, I don't think we should be tying their hands with what could be done with the additional funding. So if, if you wanna you want to make an amendment to appropriate an extra million dollar ask from the city, okay, have at it. I mean, I mean, you still have to get a second on it, but um, I'm not very comfortable telling Mr. Baxter where that money has to go. Again, we, your staff to student needs. So if the student needs suddenly arises, you could theoretically have a situation where you need more than that. You might have to use that. If you got the million, you might have to use the million for all staff. Exactly. And now you've already hamstrung him, hamstring, hamstrung, whatever the word is. I agree. So I think if, if you're going to ask for a million, just ask, just ask that it gets amended to a million. Madam Chair. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Cornell. So yeah, I changed my amendment to just be $1 million instead of um, being extra specific for 500,000 for personnel and 500,000 for student programs. So just a um, um, million dollars in addition to, to the budget that we're requesting. That is my amendment. 
Do I have a second on the amendment? Second for discussion. Okay, discussion. Madam Chair? Yes. Um, realistically speaking, I guess uh, this would go to either Mr. McCaffrey or Mr. Baxter. How much would, hypothetically speaking, would you want or need to put into developing a pathway program? I, I, Mr. McCaffrey's online, and that's something I would like to defer to him, if that's okay. That's fine. Mr. McCaffrey? Uh, first, you would do a needs assessment within your community on, on what there's a level of interest for. You'd also look at the uh, labor market data to see what what uh, is a growth area within within your uh, within the state uh, and within New England. Once you've identified those areas, you assess you assess your population to see what level of interest there is, and then you determine which program you, you initiate. That's not the expensive part. It gets more expensive when you have to outfit a classroom with equipment, with technology, uh, furniture, and things of that nature that support the equipment and technology. Uh, later this evening, you're going to hear a, a request for computers for a, a business pathway. Uh, last year, we received approval to transition our fashion merchandising and management program into a business pathway which is identical to what's offered in some of these other districts where we are uh, losing students. Uh, you can see the cost of what we're re requesting just for computers. I think it's 20 something thousand dollars. You add on, you add on uh, furniture, you add on staffing. You come up to a pretty big number, uh, but if students uh, are interested in participating in the program, you have full classes, it makes sense. And it's something we should run. Thank you. So, uh, uh, um, sorry, follow up, Madam Chair? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, just in, in terms of that, like, um, like, would you say a million is like a healthy number? Or is that like way over um, funded? Is 500,000 like what, what you'd more estimate it to be? Or is it just like un, unable to be answered? Do you that, would you say? Well, I need specifics uh, of, of what, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, for example, when we purchased equipment to modify our marine trades program into welding for electric boat, it was substantial money. I think we spent over $150,000 for that program. The business pathway, we may be spending about $40,000 total. It, it, it all depends on, on what type of programming you're going to be participating in. Uh, so, so it varies, but it, it it definitely would be a start to modernize what we have to bring us to the, bring us to the next level to be competitive. Uh, we do have some very strong programming uh, available uh, now. However, five hundred thousand dollars would certainly enhance our offerings at at Pilgrim Tollgate and the Career Center for our secondary programming. Okay, and uh, Madam Chair, with that being said, I think I think something that like in terms of going to the city asking for a certain amount of money um i i i'm not against it and this reasoning being why is that if we're going to them saying that we want to invest in the city essentially like in, invest further into the city to to bring more people back i think that's probably the the best thing that we can possibly go to them to say and ask for so i i agree with you mr adams that is what i was basically saying when i was first talking that you know we should go to them and we need we need money we got to bring kids keep kids here and we need kids to come here and we we need to we have we have the talent to do this we just don't have the money so I think, it, you know, I certainly would go in front of the city council and tell them that I, I why we need this money. We don't have any wiggle money. We're like, hope, you know, we're, we're laying off teachers, for God's sakes, because we don't have enough kids. I mean, that's not good. So I, I, I agree. That's what I was saying in the beginning. Dr. Thornton? To Mr. Caffrey's last point in terms of the programs we already have, I think 
the committee would see a more immediate return in terms of ramping up what you have versus a needs assessment, you know, exploring new pathways. That's a long, it's a long period of time, but we do have programs that could use a, a shot in the arm. Aviation comes to mind, taken back from, EW, from East Greenwich a couple of years ago, right? Now it's bigger, it's logistics and aviation, et cetera. But programs like that could use upgrades and the committee would see, I think a faster return on those versus the exploratory and the pathways is also a good conversation. It's just, I don't want the committee to think that's gonna happen in September and you're gonna have a new path. No, well, we, we obviously understand that Dr. Yeah. Thornton. It's it's for future. I yeah. mean, but we have to we have to focus now for the future. We can't just sit around and say, oh, this, this is terrible. I mean, we can't, we have mm -hmm. to be proactive on this and I'm ready to, and I think this committee is ready to, and I know Mr. Baxter is ready to yeah. move forward on things like that. And I know Mr. McCaffrey is too. And I, I would add also that uh, uh, that this year, Rye did not approve any programming statewide for CTE. Uh, they held back and didn't approve any programs. And and, and Dr. Thornton is right. We need to uh, support our existing programs. That, that will get our biggest bang for our buck with, with our existing programming. Uh, but long term, we should have a, a plan as well. Thank you, Mr. McCaffrey. May I? Yes. Oh. But that plan, that plan should be in the budget. At the last minute, why are we going to the city to ask for more money when they already know that we have a balanced budget? This is a little bit bizarre. And maybe you haven't spent as much time in front of the city council as I have, or maybe the city council has changed dramatically with its new members. I'm not sure. But you know, I remember practically begging the city for $300,000. And actually, I did beg, but, you know, it was very, it was like pulling teeth. It, it was so difficult because the city is not exactly flush either. So to ask for an extra mill to, like, fluff things up or create things is, you know, that's nice, but I, I don't think the city is going to um, react well to that. Um, my opinion. Well, I, I'm just going to reiterate what I said. Not myself, nor any of these members were privy to be in those meetings. And, you know, I didn't hear why. I didn't hear what. And then I'm just told by administration that we're not going to ask for any more money. And I, I don't think that's fair either. Mr. Baxter? Uh, Mr. Cornell has a question. Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah. Like, um, just because the budget is balanced doesn't mean it's right. Like, you can close half the schools and call our personnel, you can have a balanced budget, but that, it, that doesn't make it right. Like, so, like, with this million dollars, I think we can do great things and we could have good programs for, programs for students. And also, maybe we, ha we might even lay off less personnel, but at least we'll be putting the effort. And people like us putting in the effort because that's a lot of people right now feel like just by accepting budget as it is, it's like we're just um, taking things as it is and just not doing anything to help these people or to help our students. So I think this $1 million, it, it, it shows that we're putting, we care about our community and we want to do as much as we can for our community. Thank you. Hey, I... um, Mr. Tess is gonna go first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of things. We're essentially, we're essentially asking the city to, to function a little bit as a venture capitalist for us. And I don't think that's appropriate. Um, with, with all due respect, Mr. Cornell, I mean, you think that the community is going to say, oh, great, you're asking for an extra million dollars because we're going to do this. It's going to be good. There's a sizable contingent of people in this city who don't have kids in these schools. And they're going to look at us and say, you have, you have a budget process. You went through your budget process and you came out here. Now you're asking here because you wanna do some extra stuff. When the city is gonna tell you, they can't tell us how to spend that money. So just for the sake of discussion, they give us the million dollars. We have a couple of contingencies where we have to have, we have, to have some special educate, some special ed teachers, right? We chew up all that with no, no significant return of kids Right? You might have a selective targeted thing and you need special aid and other services. Then that million they gave us didn't go to what we said it was going to go to. Then we're going to go, well, we tried. Right? But, but this isn't how the process is supposed to work. 
And I think, I can't speak for my council people, I can't speak for my council person, but if I were a council person and the schools came to me and I paid attention to what was going on with the school budget and, and for us to say, we don't know what the condition of the city's in, it's been very public in the beacon and in the journal about the tax collection rates and about how the mayor's proposal is to have a no tax increase budget this year because of primarily COVID. Um, and whatever surplus was there is, is quickly shrinking. So I think, I think we should have a sense of what the fiscal climate is in the city. So I, I, that's why I don't think it's, it's an appropriate ask of the city for an extra million dollars because we'd like to have an extra million because we'd like to do more things. Um, of course we would. But if we want to do more things, it should be reflected in the budget that's put forward to us to approve. So I, I mean, again, we're going to we're going to vote this up or down, or however we want to go, and that's fine. Uh, and, and the decision of the committee will be the decision of the committee. I, I'm just cautioning that I don't think this is the right course to take. I would just like to add to, to that, Mr. Testa, that I don't think it was the right course of action to have these discussions with not a school committee person involved at all. Uh, understood, but but it doesn't change the calendar. But but it would have helped. Yeah, woman. If if I was if I was able to be there, or I put you there, or Miss Bacchus, or Nathan, or any one of you in there, you could have reported back to us. Instead, we're just getting a budget saying we're not asking for any money. So, yes, uh, yeah. I think Karen, Karen, yes, Miss Bacchus. Yeah. So. I mean, did you ask to be at those meetings? I did not know anything about them, Ms. Bacchus. Well, I'm sorry about that. I am too, thank you. you know, this this is what, it, it, it starts in January and moves along. Um, but, I did um, not get I, an invitation or a warning to any of them. I don't know what days they took place or when. I just I, know that it says that we're not asking for any money and that there were meetings. I understand. With the million dollars, I just wanted to say, um, Mr. Cornell, what is the annual budget right now for the school department? You know, it's over a hundred and seventy five million dollars. I'm aware of that money doesn't go as far as you think it might go. And it's less than 1% of our budget. I'm Chair. So um, like part of this money will be going through student programs. So we're, we're being forward thinking on this. We're trying to help students with these student programs because like students, they've been deprived a lot over the last year. So they, so they need these programs. They need something and i know i went through these, the school system i went through the music program and i know that they are lacking materials like they were, we we're lacking instruments and many and sport the sports program have similar problems and all programs have these problems like they don't have the materials so this could help them with these materials so they can have the best experience possible and the other part of this million dollars will go to personnel because right now as it is we have 35 layoff notices going out but these are people like if some of this might can mitigate how many people are laid off we might we're probably not going to be able to save all 35 um, FTEs, but however, if we can save some of these people, like that will be great because these are people, these people who have worked hard and have suffered through the coronavirus and th they're probably not doing fiscally well either. And like, we, we need to sh show that we care about these people. And that's why there are so many people upset that we didn't, uh, that we would accept the budget as it is and not increase because they feel like we have given up them, on them. Well, we, well, I haven't. So I'm going to be requesting $1 million. And if that can help with that, and with student programs, I'll do that. Madam Chair. Through the chair. Yes, Mr. You just, when you have something, when you want something like that, when that's a need, when that's a want, it goes into the budget. I'm sorry that nobody was there for the budget, but the fact is those things go into the budget. Thank you. Madam uh, Chair, just talk. Two quick thoughts first. In terms of a meeting, um, I have a standing meeting with the mayor twice a month on Friday morning at 8.30. I'm invited. Mr. Baxter came to the last couple. I can't speak to who he invites. I don't control that, but I go twice a month. My, my second point is, um, as I understand it, and Mr. Hennis can correct me, the budget we're giving you right now is a superintendent's budget. It's our best thinking of what the budget could be. And now it, it'll become the school committee's budget. 
So in our opinion, we didn't believe we should have more funding from the city. That's our just our call. That's all. Madam Chair, if I may, to Mr. Cornell's point, Mr. Cornell, Mr. Baxter did say that all of our programs are funded in this budget. That was one of the reasons why the, the budget, as you presented it, said we haven't touched the program, right? So your, your brush is a little too broad, okay? And in, in saying that, you know, student, of course students have suffered. Of course they have, okay? And, and we could go back about, as far as music programs and, and, and how much you replace instruments or whatever it is, I get that. But all that bubbles up from the budget so it, the school committee, I don't believe is here to sprinkle magic dollars or here, here's some extra dollars because we don't have, that, that's, not, that's not how the budget process works. And I do share your concerns. Every, every FTE is a person. I understand that. I do, I do. And, 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 I, and I, am, I am blessed that I have never had to be in that situation, but that situation happens. And, and we can't just structure a budget to just keep people employed. That, that's not the, the intention of the budget. If the, if the student need is there, then our expectation of everybody in this administration is to staff to that student need. That, that's, so you're trying to build a cushion in where there's already a process if, if there is increased student need, how we, how we fill that. So that's all, I, I, and I'm not gonna say any more, and I know your, your motion is, who seconded, right? You had a second, right? So we had a second. So. Um, Second with discussion. With discussion. So the next step would be to call a vote on his amendment, okay. right? All in favor on the amendment? Can you, can you uh, repeat, the, repeat the motion, please? The amendment. Um, the, amendment. The, uh, yeah. the amendment is to add an additional um, $1 million to the um, school department budget. Madam Chair, budget. I have one more question. Yes. Uh, so we'll go to Mr. Baxter. Um, kind, kind of um, in in response to Mr. Uh, Mr. Testa's example that he gave earlier that um, let's say the need was to arise for spe uh, special education teachers and that could eat up the, the $1 million. But if $1 million wasn't attributed to the budget and we still incurred that need, where would we get the money to pay for that? Okay. Um... Well, let's go through this in a couple of different right. So, so the to take that question apart. The the first part is is if uh, I guess direct to to pull up from uh, Dr. Thornton's um, statement. So the budget right now is our best thinking for next next year, and uh, of course uh, we need to prepare for contingencies. And so at this point we have the. Uh, what I'll call the, the, the slack in the budget, the, I don't want to use that word, the, the capacity and the staffing and the planning to absorb uh, those changes because it's, the question is not if, we, we know that they're going to happen, right? We, we know that at the last minute changes happen and uh, the academic team uh, will be looking for moves in staff, uh, changes in staff, additional staff in that case. And so we, we have to make that work. So uh, we typically do that again every year with either no increase in funding or, which we typically do, and, or we would look, we, we actually we don't even look for more funding. We do that with no increase in funding and we do that at the expense of other budget priorities. Every time, every time you're presented with a new position, uh, when um, a new co-teacher or a new teacher is presented to you and we ask, a, um, uh, that because due to student need, we need this. Uh, we don't get an increase in revenue. We end up uh, paying for that position uh, at the expense of some other priority, some something, you know, whether it's art supplies or music or more likely, um, you know, some other something. And, and in general, uh, just as we might see unfavorable, what we call unfavorable variances, we also see favorable variances. Uh, we pick up additional savings as we go along. We encourage our budget managers to be uh, prudent stewards of the funds uh, that they have been appropriated. And uh, we, we generally see this uh, work out over the course of the year. So, so I, I guess the first- I have a question related to that. In an average year, how much variation could there be in a budget of $173 million? 
oh, it's um, we we we're typically it's it's in the millions. It's it's uh you know uh, you know one two million dollars mm -hmm. because it's a very small percent. But it sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. But it's a very small percentage of our overall operating budget. So thank yeah thank you very much. So so I guess so so you asked several questions. The first the first part of the question is is you know how how would we handle the contingency? Uh, and I'm I'm giving you just a recap. I'm giving you a two part answer. The first is we've got uh, extra capacity built in, and uh, the second part is if we exceeded that capacity, then we would come to you and ask for. Uh, additional positions to be included, you know, for your approval to add additional positions, in which case we would pay for those at the expense of other programs. Now, uh, that said, uh, again, just to go back, I, I strongly encourage you, uh, you know, in, in the course of making these motions, even if we do, uh, even if you do, I should say, uh, adopt the motion to uh, increase our request from the city for the local appropriation. I strongly encourage you not to reduce the number of position uh, uh, position closures as a result of declining enrollment. Because again, we're on, as I mentioned at the beginning of our comments, we're, we're on a you know, contra contractually regulated timetable. And uh, if we don't take a specific action and, and Dr. Thornton and uh, Ms. Danbrook can, can speak to this in more detail, then we're not able to do that. And then that will definitely put us at, uh, in a, um, you know, a, a, a fiscal problem. And then the, the third point that I'd like to make, again, as I'm tearing, you know, piecing out, parsing out your question there, Mr. Adams, is um, uh, by implication, why the professional staff, and uh, just to, again, re repeat, what we mentioned uh, before, you know, during our presentation last week, two points. Uh, the first is that uh, we have already gone through and what I'll call streamlined the um, uh, mostly the Y staff and the administration staff over the last several years. And the second point, and this was very uh, adeptly mentioned by Ms. Netko during public comments, the Professional staff is directly related to student enrollment, where uh, whether I have, when I have a building with a principal in it, whether I have 200 kids in it or 400 kids in it, I still have one principal, right? It's not directly related to student enrollment, but the faculty is. And the student enrollment has dropped over 13% since fiscal 16 and our, and our uh, authorized uh, budgeted FTE comp of professional staff has not. So it's only dropped about 5%. So, so we need to uh, make those, um, those adjustments uh, to, to follow that in line. So I don't know, I, I, I know you probably asked for the time and I'm explaining you how to build the clock, but I, I hope that that, <laughs> that helps. Well, I understand it's like it, basically what my, the, the premise of my question was, um, like just just to really get like kind of get get it out there as well uh, but also get a handle on like if a million dollars was to make its way into the budget and with the intention to put towards pathways and to develop uh, to either um research new ones or to build on our current ones um to kind of just make sure that like um if that event uh, that Mr. Testa had uh, stated occurred like how is that handled Maybe because like if it if it's, it does end up coming out of that million dollars but as uh as you said that if we weren't to add a million dollars it would it could potentially come from other areas and then other areas have to suffer it, that that's true although again just i guess to uh, reiterate we are i'm using the term that million dollars that extra capacity we already have that built into the, the budget uh, so to speak. Additionally, uh, let me rephrase it. So, so we are requesting the, um, the closure of 34 positions due to declining enrollment. Right. If, we were, if we were to match uh, and follow the 13% or, 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 or maintain the same student uh, professional staff ratio, uh, we would have been asking for more, more like 74 um, positions to be closed. 
So we've got, and, and Mr. McCaffrey can speak speak to this in more detail, but, but we've got a significant amount of capacity there to absorb. So we've already kind of got that million dollars kind of built into the budget, so to speak. The, uh, to, to Mr. Cornell's point, so, uh, you know, where that, uh, you know, I do, I do think it's, it's reasonable to go back and, and ask for maybe a half a million dollars extra for additional programming. I mean, it never hurts to ask, but I wouldn't count on it, you know? So I wouldn't, uh, re, I, I wouldn't change the structure of the budget, the, the, the staffing and, and, and assume that, that we're gonna get it. I, uh, it makes sense to ask for it and put it towards a particular um, you know, pathway. I mean, we could always use the additional funding, but, uh, but again, I just go back and repeat, we should maintain the, um, uh, the, addition, the, the staffing schedule the, the way we presented it. That would be my suggestion. Right. No, I understand that. I only, uh, I've only been using the term a, a million because that's what's on the table. Hmm. Um, but I, I mostly, I wanted to see the, how, how the event would play out with having an extra million in the budget, or if it did not, as uh, Mr. Testa had explained with that in mind, I'm not exactly too worried about a, uh, if special education um, need a rose that happened to be in a million dollars, if we have that contingency already built in. All right. Well, um, that's all I have. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? So we need to vote on, on Mr. Cornell's motion to amend. Yeah, I'll I'll do a roll call. Mr. Testa? No. Mr. Adams? No. Ms. Bacchus? No. Mr. Cornell? Aye. And myself, aye. Motion and failed. Motion. Motion failed, so now we're back to the original motion that original Mr. Motion Testa made. To Madam Chair? Okay. Yes. I would also like to put forward a, uh, an, emotion, uh, an amendment. <laughs> Try that again. <laughs> I would also like to amend <laughs> Mr. Testa's motion. Okay. Mr. Adams? Uh, rather, basically the same as the million, just instead of a million, $500,000. And just, just so everyone's clear to, to reiterate Mr. Baxter's point, it's the superintendent's recommended budget with all of the appropriate cuts and additions with an additional request for $500,000. Is that right. correct? Yeah, it, the, the additional request for $500,000 as was de defined by Mr. Baxter that he would put it in a object code that we could hopefully put towards uh, um, development in our current programs or research into other ones if uh, if available. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Cornell. So Mr. M, so so would any of this money be um, utilized for personnel? With as as it's gone, no. Oh okay. Thank you for the clarification. We we just need a second on that motion. Okay, is, is there a second for that? Second for discussion. Discussion? I'll just take a, a, a vote, Mr. Testa. Oh, wait. Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I will vote for this because this is more, this is for the students, $500,000. This is good supply for students. But I will say that I, I would rather have the million dollars. So then some of this, we could have saved some um, FTEs and we couldn't. So I am disappointed about that. But I will be voting for this because anything for students is, is good. So I will be voting for this. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Adams? Just just to reiterate Mr. Baxter's point, there is built in, um, there is a built in cushion, so to speak, um, for lack of a better word, in, in case we do need to bring them back uh, or for any that we need to bring back. And again, it's also to Mr. Baxter's point that um, not putting exactly a label on it be, um, because like, we don't want to be like pigeonholed into where we want to put the money. 
That's it. Okay. I'll take a, a, a roll call on this. Mr. Testa? No. Ms. Bacchus? No. Mr. Adams? Aye. Mr. Cornell? Aye. And myself is an aye. So, so Madam Chair, that, that amendment passes. Now you need to call for a vote on the motion as amended. Okay. So now we'll take a vote on the motion as amended. Which, which, Mr. Hennius, is the budget plus the half a million dollars. That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Testa? No. Ms. Bacchus? Nay. Ms. Mr. Adams? Aye. Mr. Cornell? It's not the best budget, but aye. And I'll vote aye. The ayes have it. Okay, the uh, next item is uh, discussion action on the high school master plan option. Mr. Locker and Mr. Bourget. Mr. Madam Chair, I think on number one, or, or do you want to skip that one? Oh, I'm sorry, the school calendar. I'm sorry. Madam First, Chair? Yes, Ms. Bourget. I, I would ask that um, Mr. Locker and Mr. Bourget have been here for a while. I would ask Right, that exactly. Okay, so we're going to do two Hold instead on. of one. First, so we're going to let them go first, okay? You have the floor, Mr. Locker, Mr. Bouget. All right, Frank Locker here. Uh, we have um, been with you for the last several meetings, uh, covered uh, specifics of our, of, of our recommendations. Um, so at this time, we have no further to add to that. I'd be glad to entertain any questions. Any questions? I, I, I have a question. Um, I'm a little concerned about building two schools with the current decline. And I don't, we didn't really discuss just building one school. And I just wanted your thoughts on that, Mr. Locker. Uh, yes, um, so um, our work uh, was based on enrollment documentation uh, that was pretty much le leading up to uh, the end of 2019, because our work was done basically in the very beginning of 2020. Um, and it's based on the NASDAQ enrollment projections that we had at that time, uh, which is the standard way of doing these. Uh, it's, and it's based on a 10-year projection, which is normal. Um, so um, what I've come to understand is that uh, Oh, okay. and, and, and therefore, our, our report is entirely framed with reference to that enrollment number. Um, there are many reasons to do the, to, to carry on with the two schools as, as you have now. And, and I can certainly um, uh, enumerate some of those uh, and they are outlined in the report. Um, you know, as you may recall, this was a while ago, uh, the request for proposals identified a single school building as one of the options. Uh, and after we led the visioning, um, we had so much um, response from the, uh, fr from the Warwick stakeholders, because that was one of the visioning issues. Uh, we had so much of a response against a single building uh, we chose instead to expand the options related to the different ways of, of, of managing the, the two that you have, uh, rather than the one that was clearly in disfavor. Uh, but I, I could certainly speak to some of the characteristics of what a single building might be like. Um, and so, um, the enrollments have shifted. Um, we've had some discussion on that. They've, they've dropped. Um, we've had some discussion on that in the last hour or so. Um, if that's um, significantly different, then maybe it is cause for 
for, 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 for you know, a, a reconsideration, um, or at least a, 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 a deep breath to check things. Um, I wouldn't conclude that the recommendations that we made are inappropriate, even if the enrollments drop. Um, it certainly could be that if the 10 year enrollments based on recent en enrollment shifts uh, have dropped, then the, the, the size of the proposed buildings would be dropping. Um, and that's an accountable way to do it. That is what would be part of a normal process uh, that, that ride overseas, and that's the process that you are in. Uh, so um, that's a normal part of doing the work. Um, so um, that a, a, a single building would be a substantial change from what we have recommended, recommended and certainly at this point, because I, I know of no more details um, other than that, um, enrollments have dropped, uh, and we, we, we would have to get additional information to even give any more consideration to that question. I had a question, Frank. Uh, I know it's hard to forecast enrollment, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years in, in the ebb and the flow, but as you build buildings around, around the country and the world, do you have like a business plan for like kind of the average size high school? And if you do, how does that jive with what you see with our, our numbers? Um, well, um, the average, the quote unquote average size high school uh, varies by, uh, by part, part of the country and it, and it varies by um, or, or the urban to, to rural transition. Um, I, I would say that um, in New England, uh, the current size of your buildings, roughly, you know, 1,200 or 1,000 to 1,200 kids is um, probably, except for the big cities, um, uh, like Boston, for example, Springfield, um, the, that, that is at the high norm. Um, many, many, many high schools, uh, less, less than 1,000 kids. Um, so, um, so, so doing the planning as we did with the numbers that we were holding um, seemed completely within the norm. If you want to go to um, the Midwest, uh, you will see uh, larger, larger high schools. If you go to the South where school districts are organized on a countywide basis, um, and therefore they're managing 30,000 students in one administration, they always package them in, in um, larger building sizes. Uh, Arizona and California would also have larger building sizes as the norm. So Phil, there's no um, uh, single answer. However, New England is easily characterized as, as trending towards much smaller sizes than, than in other parts of the nation. And I think a lot of that has to do with the size of the uh, school administrative units. Thank you. Madam Chair, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Fergie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one quick question to Mr. Locker. Um, Mr. Locker, you said that you were using data from around 2019, but you were still looking at data projections out to roughly 2030. What was the enrollment projection numbers that you were looking at when you started your planning and my understanding is that the current budget documents had NASDAQ data that had enrollment projections out to 2030. To get my head around what you're saying, I'd like to know what the differential is of the NASDAQ data that's on the table today versus the NASDAQ data that you're using um, to see uh, how much of a dramatic differential we have on student counts from what you think you were working with to what we have on the table tonight. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we know what we were working with. I'm not sure what the... Um, well, that, I can answer that second piece, though. If you could tell us what the numbers were that you were looking at as a projection for 2030. Okay, all right. So bear, bear in mind that our data comes from the same source that any uh, updated data comes from, and, and that is the New, New England School Development Council. 
Um, they they do most of the projections for Rhode Island and probably uh, all of Southern New England. Um, our enrollment total for uh, citywide, uh, it projected to the year 2930 is 2,416. High school students is what you were, what you were looking at. Correct, yep. Okay, yep. and I believe if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Bax is here, um, the report that I received had NASDAQ data projections of about 1,950 or thereabouts. It was just a little under 2,000. That's correct. So, so, so you're talking about a four to 500 student shift of, of data that was on the table from where you were two years ago to today. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, approximately that. But hang, hang, excuse me, uh, Tony. Um, yeah. I, the the date of the Nesdaq um, documentation or projection that we based our work on was February sixth, twenty twenty, and and that's why I said it was using two thousand nineteen data because there usually the October first date is used for. Um, uh, the official measurement of student enrollments everywhere. That's across the country. Okay. That's what I'm trying to wrap my head around is the national, they're both the same organization with about a 600 student or 500 student differential in about 12 months. Yeah, that's a, a that's a, a phenomenal drop. Uh, and, and certainly in the last hour or so, we heard in a number of issues related to that. Yeah. Um, and and I, the in in my mind as a, as a planner, uh, and recognizing that when one makes buildings, one needs to make them so that they have flexibility, and so that they uh, are planned to withstand uh, variations in enrollments that may go up and down or spike up and down in short spurts for um, for, for you know in this case. Uh, understandable reasons. Um, I would not be looking uh, as much about the, uh, the the current enrollments, but at the at the projection that NESDEC has. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Baxter. Yeah, Madam Chair, may may I ask uh, yeah. that based on the uh, additional information, if we could just table this selection for this evening, possibly to the next. Uh, school committee meeting, just to give my team and I a, a chance to um, to huddle up, come up with additional proposals, get our, uh, you, you know, uh, make sure we know what's best operationally for the district and, and to help increase enrollment and, uh, you know, all of the good things that we've talked about, if, if I may say, if I may ask that. I, I would agree to table that. I mean, sure. I, I would support a table. Yeah, I, I would, I would table that because it is a concern of mine. I mean, um, chair, we, hold on, I'm speaking. Uh, I mean, we um, watched the consolidation go through the city already, and I would hate to see us but make a school and then in five years of it being open, we close it. So, you know, I'm chair, I'm yes, in. Mr. Testa. Um, two things. Number one, um, Mr. Locker, to your point, yes, we, we when you have the community sessions, the community got behind too. Um, but I would also just say for the record that I believe when Newport opened Claiborne Pell, they opened the school and immediately it was too small. And I think when East Greenwich built Archie Cole, I think they initially were gonna build it to X capacity, they built it to a lesser capacity. And as soon as it opened, it was overcrowded. I think what happens is, and I could be wrong, but my gut tells me, and, and I'm gonna trust it, that if, if a community commits itself to either building branded schools or major remodeling of schools, you're talking to high school. So what I think that does is it takes the, the family of the second, the current second, third or fourth grader and says, wow, all right, the city's serious about what's going on. So when, you, when their child gets to the middle school years and the choice comes before them, it's a different dynamic because now they're not going into that same school that I went to and my father went to when they were kids. It's a different, it's a, it's a different school. So I would caution, you know, when you build, when, when you build to what you have, yeah, you have to be very cautious not to underbuild it, right? Mm -hmm. Because 
the, the, the upswing mean? comes later. And, and I believe all the NASDAQ data from Jesus from 2009, when I started looking at this stuff for other, other things, it always showed Warwick declining, plateauing, and then a gradual increase because Warwick is a, Warwick is a city of single family homes. It's a it's single family, two and three bedroom homes. Okay, so demographics will will play when when I'm old and gray, well when I'm old and already gray. <laughs> when I'm out and, and I move on, people moving into my house are going to be people who have maybe one or two kids. So I'll be my house should be inhabited by someone who has children, the number of which we don't know. So mm -hmm. I just want to caution about um, you know and I think uh, Pell School and, and Archie Cole I think are kind of examples in that. So. You know, let's just just be careful. But I have no problem tabling it and giving Mr. Baxter some time to do what he needs to do, and then we can look at him. Yes. Uh, may, may I respond? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, David, you outlined some realities of the situation that we and every other school district is in. Um, we have the. Uh, I mean, th there are many factors involved here. One is the attractiveness of new and renovated buildings, and it, and, and uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, the immediacy of, of school choice. So uh, not only is it a long-term planning issue for parents choosing to move into a district or out of their current district, it's an immediate thing where, where, where kids can jump ship. Um, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that um, our visioning was, yes, it led to uh, facilities concepts, but the major part of the work had to do with educational concepts. And in that work, there was a desire to increase CTC programs and shift them to both schools, creating more opportunities. Um, the, there was a, a shift in the model of, of daily, daily classroom deliveries. Uh, in, into what I would characterize as a full embracement of a 21st century model. Um, and, and of course, your buildings were planned smack dab in the middle of the 20th century, um, and they restrict the educators from shifting the practices. So I would say that um, there is a very strong possibility that as we change programs, as we change daily deliveries, uh, and oh yes, as we have new or, or re renovated to equal new uh, buildings that, uh, th that the enrollments will shift and then it will be aggravated by, your, by what you've noticed is that houses will be sold, but will be rolled over. And the de de demographers say that the biggest cause of changing school enrollments is when um, people sell their houses. So you get a whole part of the city with elderly people, um, that's gonna predictably, be, if they're affordable houses, that is predictably going to be a, a whole part of the city full of school age kids. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you. I think Ms. Yeah. Bach is, yes. You know, the saying, if they build it, if you build it, they will come, is very true. And we can't pick one school over the other. They both need to be brought up to the new century standards. Um, we will have kids. Of that, I have no doubt. A lot of kids are leaving our district because of our older buildings and lack of turf, football, uh, stadiums, and things like that. But as we improve them, I believe more kids will come back. And it's shown that in every other way. And that's what happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And, you know, we had to go to double sessions. So, so people won't have as many kids, but I think two schools are not going to be uh, un go unused. And I wouldn't like to see a plan redone because this has been worked on a great deal. Well, we're, we're tabled until. Oh, hold on, Mr. Cornell oh, has something to say. Yeah, so I, I agree that um, this this should be tabled because we need to do our due diligence, and I, I think it's good that you mentioned the consolidation process because, like, that was rushed, and we cannot rush into this. I remember 
go into the consolidation meetings and just see a whole debacle. And I think they could have done a lot more than they could have been the previous school committee, but that's the past. But with this, we can, we can do great things with this. I think this is a great opportunity, but we, we just cannot go too fast on us. We need to make sure we have a good plan and do our due diligence. So I'm in favor of tabling this for now. Okay, I'm gonna table this till our next meeting. Thank you, Madam okay. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Locke and Mr. Bourgeois. I'm sorry that you know you had to sit here and listen to part of our meeting, but quite all right. We 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 need to do our due diligence, as Mr. Cornell said. And I don't disagree with what has been going on. I'm just a little concerned with the population decline. Um, that maybe it is something we need to look at. And Mr. Baxter feels that there is a need to look at it. So no harm. <laughs> Okay, now we're gonna do number one, which is discussion action on the 2021-22 uh, work school calendar. And that's gonna be Dr. Thornton. Madam Chair, good evening. You have a draft calendar in your packet, as you see, like this with the color codings, if you will. As you can see in the draft, the uh, 30 and 31 of August, the staff development teacher orientation days, first day for students proposed is the first of the month. You can see also the holidays in September. Uh, in essence, you, you have uh, four PD days scattered across the, uh, the calendar year, two in the fall, two in the spring. And in this model, um, last day of school is uh, the um, 17th of June, of, January, of June. So that's the proposal. Happy to take any questions. I would also add, Madam Chair, um, we surveyed a host of districts and there is a range of, um, of calendars, some a little later, some, uh, you know, earlier some getting out um you know late june mm -hmm. this model is yeah I, thank you actually actually in terms of all the comparables we did stay uh close to west warwick as we right, work with them right. quite a bit mm -hmm. so right. once again happy to answer any questions do we have any questions i do okay uh, miss barkas dr thornton are the vacations with west warwick and the neighboring schools the same for the most part Statewide. statewide, we have the statewide calendar adopted for that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I move approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Number three, discussion update on transportation. Mr. Baxter, please. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just wanted to, um, again, brief you and the community that's listening uh, regarding transportation because of the challenges that we've had. And uh, uh, essentially the latest development is that we are in the process of planning and uh, I just need to, to validate, at, at, uh, we're expecting any day now, if it hasn't already been uh, announced that uh, busing will be, uh, the busing restrictions will be relaxed. We'll be able to accommodate 75% uh, capacity on the buses. Our intention, if and when that happens, is to uh, utilize the extra capacity to pick up more of the elementary school folks, especially some of the hardship cases that we haven't been able to serve and, uh, and run from there. So, so uh, up until now, uh, we have been continuing to, to streamline. We've had uh, relative success with some of the other programs that we've been running. Um, but uh, again, keep in mind that this has been a, a, a yeah, I don't want to sugarcoat it. This has been a very challenging year and um, uh, you know, we, we're just continuing to do the best we can. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question. Um, the only question I have is, are we looking at for next year, obviously, to bring back the mileage to be lower from where you live? Yeah, oh yes, ab absolutely. It's, it's built into the, the budget that you just uh, passed is a, um, and, and assuming everything gets, you know, we adopt it eventually in July. Uh, our intention is to, uh, to come to you with um, a request to reduce the, the walking distances across all grade levels. And uh, my team is currently, uh, again, taking some of the lessons that we've learned about how to economize and use the buses as effectively and efficiently as possible to do that come back, we're hoping to be able to even reduce the walking distances to where they were uh, even beyond what, where they were pre-COVID 
and then uh, and then go from there. So we'll have more to report uh, as we approach the end of the year. And then once we get, uh, we're working on developing what I'll call, uh, you know, the strategy to, to do that. And then once we've got that strategy nailed down, which we're hoping to have uh, sometime end, end of May, early June, and we will then have the uh, some specifics to, to ask you to, to vote on, then we'll go out over the course of the summer and turn that into, you know, detailed routes. Excellent. Madam Chair, I have one question for Mr. Baxter. Yes. Um, when, the, when you said that the capacity is only 75%, I know the state did that. Is that in effect now, or are you just waiting for the official pronouncement that that's in effect? I'm, I'm waiting for the official pronouncement. I have been uh, out of the office the last couple of days, so I, I may have missed it, but okay. I don't believe I have. And, and when you say that you might be able to go back to, I'm going to assume, pre-COVID walking distances? For, for next year. For next year. For next year. For, for this year, um, we 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 will try to when I'll say pick up around the margins of the existing. Yeah, no, I, I, know. I, I, I what I'm what I'm getting at is when Ms. Ms. Cobbin said that you know that reducing the walking distances, and I know one of the plans is like depot stops. So it would it a depot stop would allow us to go back to shorter walking distance, shorter right. distances. But Everybody instead of picking the kid up in front of their house, we're going to pick them up at a depot stop. So it's a more efficient use of the bus. And that's absolutely correct. And, and, and the walking distances that we're looking for, whether walking to school or walking to, uh, walking to the depot stop uh, are what, what I would call uh, a, a, a realistic distance to walk. Okay. And so we're, we're looking in the neighborhood of like four tenths of a mile, half a mile or and so. And I don't want to, to hold you to a number now. It's, it's okay. because what you say now will be remembered. Yeah, right. yeah. So, yeah, 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 I got yeah, you. Don't, we're, don't we're still, do that. We're still, tra- yeah, understood. Yeah, we're still trying, we're still trying to iron that out, but that, that's do our that. goal. That's our goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah then you'll, yeah, you'll Please get a lot don't. of calls. I'll get a lot of calls. Absolutely. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much, Mr. Baxter. I know you're working very hard on that. Thank you. Okay, the next is discussion action, food service meal price increase. Ms. Machado. Uh, Ms. Excuse me, Are you going to be doing that? Well, yeah, Ms. Machado has uh, taken ill, so uh, I will try to. Hope she feels better. Uh, yeah, same here. Same here. So, so what you see before you is uh, a recommendation on behalf of Ms. Machado and our, and our team to raise the uh, lunch prices. The lunch prices haven't been raised in uh, many years. I want to say almost 10 years and uh, we went out and did a survey, which is also included in your uh, packet uh, of where we stand by, you know, primary, middle school, and secondary, uh, and, and high school, uh, where our lunch prices stand with re- relative to other districts. And uh, we're recommending what we believe is a modest increase of, uh, in the neighborhood, depending on which grade level you look at, 15 cents to 25 cents uh, per meal. And um, again, we believe that this is a, a modest increase and uh, uh, it is, puts us in line with the average for other districts and um, it is not, not a hardship. Any questions, comments? I just have one for Mr. Baxter. Um, in the packet, it says, um, what does it say? To, to remain in compliance with federal federal regulation. So is is the what you a district charges for the school lunch part of those regulations? Oh yeah. So 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 every year we complete the oh uh, the, it's like the lunch equity report. Basically it it, it uh, looks at our lunch prices, it looks at the what I'll call the the uh, health of the lunch fund, right? The, so the lunch finances, the lunch program handle. In its own individual fund, and it looks to see how much money we're contributing, uh, but more importantly, uh, to make sure that we're not making money on, on the lunch fund, but that also that we have, um, you know, an equitable lunch price. So, uh, so yeah, so everything the lunch, the, the, I will say, the lunch program is extremely uh, uh, tightly regulated by the the federal government and enforced by the state. Yeah, I knew that. And I know in past years sometimes you, the program runs some deficits and, and things like that. Um, so does raising the price theoretically help impact it, that deficit? It it will. I mean, obviously, it will help. Uh, but our our deficits have typically been and, and uh, have been 
um, uh, low to mid uh, six figures. So anywhere from like 200 to $500,000 over the last several years per year. And uh, this will not uh, contribute very much to, to changing that. I will say that the, uh, the cafeteria remodel that we're, we're currently working on and uh, we will be coming to you, I think in the May, I'm hoping in May or, or the June school committee, uh, that will go a long way towards addressing the, uh, the lunch fund deficit. Uh, the lunch fund deficit is, uh, uh, has several components, but the largest component is, is the continual um, repair and replacement of extremely aged, um, just lunch food preparation equipment. And part of the, um, part of the program that we're doing is, is a, and, and obviously, and we also have two uh, commercial kitchens, what I'll call commercial kitchens, one at Winman and one at Pilgrim that we use to, to supply all of the schools in the district, which are not in the best place uh, logistically. And so the, uh, the, the project that we're working on now for next year, while it will be a, an expense, uh, should pay for itself in about a year. And, and, and again, I'll have more specifics then, but the intent is to um, refresh the kitchen at Vets, centralize the two, the two kitchens from Pilgrim and, and at Windman. So we do all of our food prep at Vets for the district. And then we put that in a centralized location now, which is at Vets. And it allows us to, uh, uh, to, to gain some efficiency. So then we would, uh, we would avoid future you know, expenses and limping along with the aged equipment that we have. And we, we expect to see savings in the lunch program because of the streamlined operation. Okay. Thank you very much. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Cornell. So it shows the updated, um, the new prices. So what are the original prices? Oh, the, the so there's, uh, and again, I don't, have the, I don't have the document in front of me, but it's uh, the, the uh, lunch price for high school is a quarter less. Give me one second. I'll, uh... Oh, thank you, sir. Just give me one minute. One moment, Mr. Cornell. Here we go. So, so um, the updated prices for um, elementary uh, elementary lunch are, I believe, two sixty, and uh, the high school lunch is about four dollars. Oh, no, 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 not that's the, the adult lunch, the one up a quarter. It was secondary lunch, $3. So, I'm going so, off the top of my head, but I believe it's just about, because we, we, we raised the price 25 cents for high school and um, I, I believe 15 cents for elementary. Okay, that, that's good to, know. good to know. I was just curious. Yep, thank you. No, thank you very much. Okay, any other further questions or comments? I'll take a vote. Move Do I have approval. A motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the next is this, number five discussion action contract award secondary automotive supplies. Mr. McCaffrey. Madam Chair, members of the school committee, in your in your packet, you'll find uh, a request to purchase new scan tools for the automotive program at the Career and Tech Center. Please note the current technology is 10 years old. It's Some of it works, some of it is breaking down, and some of it is not compatible with the vehicles that are in use today. It's time to upgrade the technology within the classroom. It's just like when we upgrade a computer lab within a school. It's necessary and it needs to be done. We had it vetted by their program advisory committee, which it, uh, which is uh, made up of representatives from 
uh, post-secondary education, industry, uh, mom and pop shops, as well as uh, dealerships. They all agree this is the technology that needs to be uh, within the curriculum and it's something we need to do. I request that you support this initiative. Thank you, Mr. McCaffrey. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. Next is discussion action, contract award curriculum, grant responsive classroom, Dr. Cecil. Yes, good, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school committee. Um, this is a um, request to approve the um, continuing professional development of responsive classroom. This is an initiative started by Mrs. D by Ms. Danbrook that's been ongoing for the past three years. We use Title IV A funds to pay for it, which has already been approved by the state. And we're going to be running the professional learning beginning in either May or June. Um, and because we'll run it during the school day, um, so far, I believe Ms. Danbrook has at least, I think, 30 teachers or so signed up um, for the uh, first round of, of um, professional learning that will start this spring. So requesting approval to pay the contract for that. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Danbrook. So I appreciate you've always supported this program. Um, this will be our fifth cohort going through the program. I actually have a waiting list um, for responsive classroom training this year. It will be virtual due to COVID, but the teachers value this um, professional development. Um, and it's so needed right now with our children going through everything they're going through. So um, I also request your approval. Thank you, Ms. Amber. Approval. approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I have it. Thank you very much, Dr. Cecil and Ms. Danbrook. Okay. Discuss and action. Contract award curriculum. Grant STEM take-home kits, Dr. Cecil. Yes. Um, this is for our Title I school-wide programs. Um, in the past, we've had um, extended day programs that our teachers have run. But this year, because of COVID, we obviously did not have um, extended day opportunities. And when I had hosted um, a parent meeting, as I'm required to do every year, one of the um, comments that came up by the parents was that they really missed having the extended day program. So I had, I called a meeting with the principals and they suggested that we look into outside vendors and outside contractors, which we did. And we actually have contracted with Roger Williams Zoo. They are starting to do um, after school uh, programs with our Title I schools. And this is um, a wonderful in, um, National Inventors Hall of Fame program. And this is to purchase the kits that the children will use to actually invent and make um, different um, objects or inventions um, through a curriculum that comes with the kits. And um, it, it, it actually, we've got um, a couple of the kids to look at and the kids were just really excited about it. And so it'll be like a six week program that will run after school um, once a week. And there's one for primary and one for intermediate. Um, the, we amended our Title I application and it was approved by Title I to um, use Title I funds to pay for it. And so we're uh, requesting your approval as well. Madam Excellent. Chair. Yes, Ms. Danbrook. I want to thank Dr. Cecil and the principals who worked together on this project. Um, the after school programs are um, full of enrichment and also allow children to have choice and also participate in project based learning. And that's the direction that we want to go to. Um, Absolutely. To. This is fantastic. Thank you, Ms. Danbrook. Any questions, discussion? Move oh, approval. Oh, oh. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I love this. This is great. It's good stuff. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Cecil. Thank you, Ms. Danbrook. 
Okay, now we're on to discussion action, contract award, maintenance, tree removal. Mr. Oliver. Good evening. I'm requesting your approval on this contract. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Cornell. So, Mr. Oliver, just to clarify, so these trees are, uh, were probably planted around the 1960s when the school was built, correct? That is correct, Mr. Cornell. Okay, so for record, these are not old growth or over 100 years old. These are young trees, so... They are, they, are, they are young trees that are uh, in need of removal because of uh, damage and rot. And just to let you know, we will be replacing uh, the trees we take down with other trees to, to go back into that space. Excellent. Thank you very much. I, I, I do have one question. Uh, I know the courtyard well. Um, it, so those are, I, I don't remember how many trees are in there. So you're taking down all those trees that are in there? No, only the ones that are listed on, on your documents. Okay, okay. Yep. Yeah, I, I did notice that some of them were in I, poor shape. Yes, if I make that, Chair. Mr. Baxter's going first, Ms. Bacchus, you can go next. Madam Chair, just, just to um, to clarify for the community, there are, I believe, 12 trees. There are six maples and six black locust trees, I believe. Uh, three, of, three of the maples need to be uh, replaced because they, uh, they're a problem, but, uh, we'll, but we will replace them, and then the other ones will be uh, cleaned up. So okay. That, so I just wanted so so there there are about twelve trees in the courtyard, and uh, this is just uh, routine maintenance. Excellent. Thank you, Miss uh, Bacchus. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> we can't see her. I wanted to move out. approval. Oh. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'll second. I just have a question. Okay. Discussion. Um, yeah. Miss, um, maybe Dr. Thornton or Miss Miss Danbrook knows these are the trees that are used for Miss Bastia's PBL, right, with the maple syrup program doesn't she tap those trees for her PBL? that's correct mr testa right so we're just going to replace them so they can keep so using they can that keep PBL doing program. it right okay. correct. madam chair yes mr cornell just so the community knows um black locust, locust trees are actually invasive they're not native to rhode island so like those are from the south and red maples are like they're they're sign of a, a younger four so they're not and they're the most common tree in rhode island so just so if the community is interested okay wonderful good knowledge mr cornell all in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. That was interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Okay, next is discussion action, change order, elementary technology at Sherman. Ms. D'Ambrook. Yes, um, the Sherman PTO wanted to buy 16 Chromebooks um, to support the students who did not have a Chromebook at Sherman School. They went on Amazon to get a pricing. And um, by the time they ordered, processed everything and ordered it, Amazon's pricing increased. It's a total of $304 over the 16 uh, Chromebooks. So I'm asking. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. That's great. I knew that would happen probably that way. <laughs> Okay, we're moving to number 11 first um, before we do 10. It's discussion action, contract award, secondary grant business pathway computers. And that's Mr. McCaffrey. Madam Chair, members of the school committee, uh, we are transitioning the fashion merchandising and management program at the Career Center uh, into a business pathway. Part of the process is to upgrade the technology within the room we're requesting to purchase 23 computers for the room. Uh, in your package, you should find spe the specifics on the purchase. I recommend passage. It's paid for with grant funds. Thank you very much, Mr. McCaffrey. We have a motion. Move approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. It's great grant money. We love it. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Okay, and now to um, number 10. Uh, the discussion action, the bid award community solar net metered credits. And that is Mr. Baxter. Yes, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, to present this, uh, this uh, request for a bid award to, to you and to the school committee. This is, uh, we went out to bid uh, for net metering credits, which basically um, uh, very short, quickly put is a, a discount on our power based on purchasing credits for electricity that was produced on another uh, out, out of district, if you will, uh, solar field. 
Uh, with us tonight is uh, Mr. Daniel Joyce from Balanced Rock Energy. He was the consultant who, who worked with us on this project. Uh, we are requesting the award to, um, uh, to Green Development. The uh, award, uh, the, I'm sorry, the bid proposal that was submitted was uh, over $2 million in projected savings, uh, more than the, uh, the next, uh, you know, the second place bid, which was uh, Revity. They were both very, uh, very good, um, you know, firms both submitted, both firms submitted very good bids, but uh, because of the, um, the very aggressive pricing uh, that was presented by Green Development, uh, we are putting forth their name for uh, approval and, and acceptance. If you have any questions, either I can address the questions or Mr. Joyce is on the online uh, Zoom with us as well. Any questions? I, I do have a question. Yes. W what is the time frame on this? Well, uh, so so there's some variability, right? So um, optimally, it might take place. Uh, you know, we could start seeing credits as early as uh, January in uh, next year. So we're we'll wondering a year from now. Uh, I don't have it. The savings built into our budget be, because um, inevitably there are always delays and whatever. And so just to be safe, uh, we're planning for the savings to start in fiscal twenty three. So there's no there's no time commitment on the contract. Uh, not, not yet. I mean, they've given us a, they have given us a, um, a an estimate, like I said, in, in terms of January, 2022, but, um, and, and, and you'll see that in balanced rock energy summary of the proposals. However, uh, based on, uh, a, you know, just construction delays and whatever, you know, the, uh, as is typical in this industry, contractors are reluctant to give a firm uh, commitment date. Did anyone offer to give a firm commitment date? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, Mr. Joyce, could you? Uh... No. Um, what, what I can say about the project that we're recommending from Green Development, the project is already under construction. Um, they have all of the approvals are in place from the, the town approvals, the RIDEM approvals. They're in process. Um, so we, we feel really strongly that the project will be going live. Um, at, as Mr. Baxter mentioned, around the end of the year or the very early part of uh, 2022. Um, there, there's certainly unknowns that, that could catch us by surprise, but at this point, everything's in place. It is under construction currently, so we feel really good about it, uh, about it going live. Um, like I said, end of the year, early part of, uh, of next year. There, there is a delay once, once the project goes live and begins to generate power, it does take a, a, a couple of months for the power to flow to National Grid and then National Grid to apply the credits to the Warwick Schools um, National Grid invoices. So there is a little bit of a delay there. So I, I think it's very prudent to, to, to not include anything in, in this year's budget. Okay, and, thank you. And, and, I, and, I, and I will say, if, if I may, just to add to that, and Mr. Joyce can, um, can confirm, but the project that was submitted by Green Development is uh, uh, was the most what I say the the most reasonable or the, the 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 least or the most likely to come in sooner. They were the furthest along, if you will, where the other ones probably had more volatility and more risk in terms of when they when they would be able to start. Is that that correct? Dan? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Mr. Cornell. So Mr. Joyce, um, so this solar project, this is on a landfill, correct? Uh, no, oh. no, it's on um, what was previously a, a junkyard with automobiles. I, I think prior to that, it, there was a portion that was a driving range. Is this the Capuano area? Th this is on, it's on Iron, Iron Mine Hill Road in, um, in North Smithfield, Rhode Island. Oh, North Smithfield. Yeah, I'm thinking of a different project. Okay, so this is a so this is a former like dumping facility. So there's not really yes. any trees or. Yeah, no, there weren't any trees taken down. They've actually cleaned up the property. Um, they've removed trailers and trailers of old um, disposed tires. They're going to be removing old automobiles that were were wrecked. 
Um, it's in a district in North Smithfield that is that is designated for solar. Um, the town is fully on board. Um, there, there, there weren't any, um, not, not that, we're, that we're aware of anyways, there were, were very little um, abutters. I think the closest abutter is about 900 feet away. Um, so it's not impacting residentials. It's cleaning up a property that was kind of kind of run down with, with lots of trash on it. Um, so this is a, a really favorable project, both from the location, from the timing, and the economics of the proposal that was put forth from Green is really at the at the very low end of the range of what we've seen over the, over the last three or four years in this market. So this is a brownfield, then? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't refer to it as a brownfield, um, but it it was just a location that was dormant and it's being repurposed. Um, the town is fully on board. Um, and it's, you know, I, I would say the town of North Smithfield is gonna be, you know, happy about increased, you know, tax base, um, increasing solar from a renewable standpoint um, and doing it without um, clear cutting trees and without impacting, um, you know, residential neighbors. Okay, thank you very much for that information. That's good to know. Any more questions or comments? Ms. Coppin. Ms. Coppin. Yes. I made a motion. Well, people had their and people it needs had their seconded and then discussion. Uh second, but I would also note that I didn't hear it. I, I didn't hear to, I didn't hear it either. But I tried to make it and you said wait. So well, because Nathan had his hand up. Well, the process is what's the process um i guess there's a motion we really didn't hear it did it for a discussion i would like to know what the motion is for, um as well though i move i move it i move it for the purpose of discussion and my question is have somebody second it so that we can go to discussion. I already did. So my question is, in your proposal, you said that you would um, start to perform, that this would be running, up and running, by the end of the year. Now, if it's not up and running by the end of the year, how are we going to handle that? Are we going to go to the next low bidder? Can you really deliver? Because now you're starting to say, oh, well, maybe in the first few months of the new year. Mr. Baxter, has a hand up? So, so if, I think that the, I'll, I'll, I'll field that question. So the, the um, uh, e each of the bidders, listed projects, the projects that, that would be associated with our purchase of credits. The, each of the projects listed were in various stages of development, you know, some as far along as, as the project on uh, uh, pr proposed by Green and others, uh, even some going back to the, the conceptual stage and then anywhere in between. This project was the furthest, the furthest along, and uh, so, so that, there's the first. So, so that minimizes the the, the risk uh, of not meeting a deadline would be even greater uh, had we gone with uh, another another bidder. Uh, second point: the the proposed uh, projected savings of over $2 million based on this project because of the, uh, because of the, 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 the net metering credit price was uh, very aggressive. Uh, would, it, it would be difficult to justify moving to a project that's not as far along uh, from another vendor with a higher credit and, 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 and postpone, not postpone, and, and forego the additional savings, it, we, it would, um, again, we, we were very, uh, I would say, uh, open to using 
other, you know, you know, we didn't have anybody that we were looking for. We we're very open to other, other vendors, uh, but it was very difficult to not select green development because their pricing was just so aggressive. It, it, it uh, they, they're giving us a very good, very good deal uh, at uh, ten, just a little over ten and a half cents per net metering credit. It's um, it would be very difficult not to award the bid to to green. Any more discussion? Madam Chair, yes, I have, I have a few questions. Um, thank you. Um, first question I have is just for the edification of the public, I don't think it was explained. This is a net metering program, so we're going to be buying energy from a solar farm, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's a very simple way to put it, yes. We're buying energy from a solar farm, and we get credited from National Grid because National Grid buys the energy from a solar farm, and they credit us. Okay. Correct. Just, just so the public knows what we're doing here. Um, it's part of this agreement, Mr. Hennius, this may be for you. It says um, we're required to sign a long-term agreement for credits for 25 years. Can, can this school committee legally do that? No. Yes. Okay, right. well, that's one. Um, and then when you get into the savings, okay, now this is all based on assumptions and I am not an energy expert by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, the, the assumptions here, it says it's based on a 2% annual increase in national grid electric charges. Okay, is that a good historical number to use? Yeah, uh, I will answer, then I'll also defer to, uh, to Mr. Joyce. So uh, yes, that, that is the, what I will call the industry standard assumption for inflation rate, uh, that the 2% per year for, uh, for power. That said, the, the net metering price presented by Green was, uh, again, uh, such that even if we assume only a half a percent inflation, which is um, not, to, to be polite, is not an industry accepted uh, assumption, that Green still presented the uh, most attractive um, bid. And I don't know, Dan, if you want to do to chime in there as well. Yeah, what, what I would add to that is that I think from an industry standpoint, I think most people would agree that 2% is a fair assumption. We can all agree that we don't know. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. But there's two realities that are certain. The, the infrastructure, so the cost that, that National Grid bills and the, the amount of money they have to put into their poles and wires, that portion is, is the delivery charge on the invoice that portion is just increasing. And we just see it, it, it additional reasons why we expect that to increase in the future um, over the next 25 years. Um, we, the second portion is the wholesale cost of power. Um, that portion fluctuates up and down. It's currently at record low levels. So I think it's also you know, safe to assume that that portion is gonna increase. You know, my, my, my opinion is probably it, it would increase at a higher rate than 2%, but 2%, I, I think, is, is a really fair um, estimate for us to use. Thank you. And the next question I would have is, in, in the proposal, it says the rate C-06, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Says, let me just see. The value of the credit is based upon the small business rate class electric price from National Grid. So my question is, is that the rate that a school department or a municipality gets. So that's the rate that National Grid and the PUC determined that they're going to use for the value of the credit. So that, that doesn't have any impact on what the district is actually paying. That, that's how they set the value. Um, that value has ranged from you know, 14 to 19 cents um, over the past four or five years. Um, in our estimated savings file, we're using 15 cents for that baseline, which is at the low end of the range. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I think two more and, and we'll be done, I promise. No problem. Uh, Mr. Baxter, we chose the fixed price versus the discount. Is that what we did? Yes, we did because that uh, presented for us the, uh, the highest projected savings. And again, the... Um, uh, the Again, based on the uh, the price that was uh, proposed by Green Development, we um, uh, you know we have very little risk 
uh, and, and usually you might one might be tempted to use the the floating uh, proposal if if uh, you uh, you were concerned about the risk uh, in terms of where the market was going to go, but uh, again, the, the because of the pricing structure, uh, it, it's in the best it's, it's it's in the district's best interest to take the twenty five year uh, fixed proposal. Okay, and I promise I'm almost done. No, no, Two good. more questions. This is all. This is fun this, stuff. This is probably to Mr. Joyce. Does does the national grid sale to the Pennsylvania company impact this in any way, shape, or form? Um, at, at this point, no, we don't, we don't expect any change, um, to the program. These are, you know, this program's in, it been in place. Um, we're, we're, you know, candidly hopeful that, um, PPL acquiring national grid will be an improvement, um, for their systems and technology and infrastructure. Okay. Thank you. And then, um, last question is, I think I already know the answer. If at some point there's a lifespan, so this solar farm eventually, if they have to replace all the solar panels and things like that, does that have any impact on, on the savings that flow to the, to the district? I mean, so in other words, like when National Grid makes investments, oftentimes they'll pass it on to ratepayers. So how does that work if, when it comes time to replace those panels? I mean, some, who's paying for that? So the, the agreement is a 25 year agreement with two optional um, five year extensions. Um, at that point, the agreement would be complete, and then um, the developer would either remove, um, and it's, it would be in the agreement, they would remove all of the infrastructure and return the land to what it was like prior, um, or they, you know, at that point may negotiate a new agreement with, you know, new technology. Okay. Um, Thank you. And the very last thing I have for Mr. Baxter, Mr. Baxter, I would, I would appreciate it if... Um, if your office would, once this goes live, that you would have a document that tracks the city. Because I, I, we do these programs a lot, and and you know, I always, I'm always very curious to see one year out, it's easy. At the third year, at the fifth year, at the ninth year, how are we trending to what the assumptions were? I uh, two things, if, if I may, I would be thrilled to do that uh, because number one. This, uh, this technology, regardless of which proposal, right? This technology is pretty much uh, tried and true, proven, and, uh, and the program has been in place. We're, we're by no means the vanguard with, with such an arrangement. And so I, I feel that this would be a success story that we should celebrate to the community, number one. Second is that in addition to the uh, financial benefit and you know that 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 we would, that we would report on. Uh, there are instructional and, and other opportunities. This developer is planning on. Uh, I, I I'll go back to. I'm, I'm going off the top of my head. I don't have the document again in front of me right now. But they um, it's in your package. They have proposed and will offer um, uh, field trips to uh, solar facilities for the farm uh, for the students. I'm sorry. They will. Uh, and they've offered to uh, come in and offer training and professional development for our instructors and to work with our curriculum team to, to help with any pathway. So, so uh, you know, if, if you, you, you're, the, the committee is starting to know my mantra in terms of optimize expense, increase revenue, and increase enrollment, this, uh, this project uh, is a significant, uh, a, a significant uh, benefit to all three of those. So expense, so that- revenue, and... And Thank you. I'm sorry, so that was one more thing. The assumption was 6 million annual kilowatt hours. I'm assuming that's an accurate number. That's actually low. At, at, the, at the current time, the district uses over 7 million kilowatt hours. So even if we were to, uh, you know, sh- shutter buildings or consolidate or see other savings one way or another, then, uh, then we would, uh, we're, still, we're, we're still within our bandwidth, I would say. Uh, second of all, um, I anticipate that as we deploy more technology over the coming decades, Promethean boards, car charges at the, 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 the schools, that sort of thing that, that we would anticipate consuming as much or even more power. And I like your idea of a potential pathway because as you know, North Kingston has a, has a wind turbine maintenance pathway program. Right? Yes. So, yeah. But, you know, I don't know if anyone has a solar pathway. No. So. Spoiler okay. alert, you'll see that in the next okay. bit. That, okay. that should be next month or month okay. after. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I took up so much of your time. Question. 
ahead. I'm sorry. Hello? Yes. Oh, well, I was waiting to be told I could speak. Uh, what happens if something happens in the 25 years and we can't or don't want to fulfill it? We get a better deal or... Uh, Rob, do you want me to answer that? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Um, so this is an agreement that we would, you know, we expect, and if you sign on to, we would expect that you would fulfill it um, for the life of the agreement. There would, if there, the, the only scenario, and I don't really see this scenario being relevant, but the only scenario where these credits would not be valuable to the district would be in a scenario where you're not purchasing any electricity from National Grid. So, so it doesn't matter what technology National Grid is using. As long as the district is purchasing electricity from National Grid, you're going to be able to monetize the value of these credits. If in some un, unseeable reason you decided to terminate the agreement, there would be termination damages that would apply. Um, in that unseeable for you know scenario, um, what, what my firm would do is work with the developer to find a new home for those credits. Um, but in that scenario, the district would be, you know, responsible for damages for any damages that were, um, that came up in the meantime from them, you know, finding a new home, if you will, for those credits. But the bottom line is it's a long-term agreement. You don't want to have any scenario where you would not purchase the credits. And I can't see any scenario where they're not going to be hugely valuable um, to the district. Well, technology is moving at a pace that's unfathomable to a lot of people. And we don't know what's going to happen in 10, 15 years down the, down the road with energy and things like that. I, I, and the other thing is, the other thing is, is that for us to, and this happened, we had, uh, we were responsible for sewer lines uh, that that go out to uh, Walter Road, and that was put in effect many many years ago by by a school committee um, that 20, 30 years ago um, put it into effect. And um, that was fine, but we didn't even know about it. So Dr. Thornton, I'm sure remembers, David can remember. Uh, Mr. Baxter? Yeah, Madam Chair, if I may uh, respond. So, so again, two points. Uh, the, the first is that the, um, uh, the assets of the solar farm are not owned by the district. And so any, anything that happens there, you know, as opposed to the sewer line, that's not that's not on us. So so I just wanted to, to um, you know alleviate any concern there that uh, there's relatively relatively little risk risk there. Uh, re with regard to the advent of new technology, um, again the you know that's based into the assumptions that we talked about. You know we so any new technology may um, affect the price that we're going to pay for power. That's basically what it boils down to. And, uh, uh, and we don't know how much the price of power is going to go up, but I think we can all be relatively confident that it will go up, even with these new technologies. And so, at, again, with, with the price that we, uh, of the, uh, the winning bid, that um, even if it doesn't go up or only goes up modestly by a, a half a percent per year, that uh, this, this uh, proposal still generates savings, significant savings for the district. And again, Dan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. But. I would just add that the, the new technology is, is, like, is going to go through National Grid. So National Grid is investing in offshore wind, you know, utility scale solar, battery technology, new technologies that we're not even aware of. So the new technologies for generating electricity are going to go through National Grid. The only scenario where you wouldn't be using National Grid is if you're generating all of your own electricity on site. And I just think that's a scenario that's just not 
not, I, I just don't think that's realistic for you to self supply all of your own electricity. <laughs> Any more questions? Discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ms. Bacchus? Said aye. Okay. Went in near you. Thank you. I have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Future meetings. Monthly school committee meeting is May 11th. And possibly you never know when will pop up, but right now it's May 11th. So do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.